Good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is um, Professor Fatwani Mudawu. I'm an acting um, DVC in the College of Agriculture, Engineering and Sciences. Inaugural lectures form part of the university public lecture series and may only be presented by newly appointed full professors who have been appointed in academic school and centers. Inaugural lectures presents an opportunity for focusing the exciting and groundbreaking research and teaching being carried out by professors in our university. Each lecture represents a significant milestone in an academic career, providing an official recognition of their promotion or appointment to full professorship. And these lectures are furthermore an ideal opportunity for new professors to introduce themselves and present an overview of their own contribution to their field to academic peers, students, and research collaborators. Inaugural lectures are also a platform for celebrating a professor's academic achievements with his or her family, friends, mentors, and colleagues. I would like to acknowledge the following guests, members of the executive management of University of KwaZulu-Natal, members of Senate, our inaugurant this afternoon, Professor Padon Mchalnyera, family friends of Professor Mchalnyera, academics, professional staff, students, alumni, and distinguished guests. A special welcome to our guests from universities and organizations in South Africa, from African continent, and across the globe. Distinguished guests, it's my pleasure to introduce our acting dean and head of School of Agriculture, Earth and Environmental Sciences, Professor Julia Sevilla, who will now formally introduce the inaugural Professor Padon Michalnyera. Over to you, Prof. Thank you. Uh, a very good afternoon to all our viewers. Uh, it's an honor for me to introduce to you this afternoon, our inaugurant, uh, Professor Padon Michalnyera. Uh, professor Mchawanyerwa is a full professor in the discipline of soil science in the College of Agriculture, Engineering and Science, University of KwaZulu-Natal. He obtained his um, BSc Agriculture Honours degree in soil science from the University of Zimbabwe with the University Book Prize for the overall best graduating student in the Faculty of Agriculture in 1995. Professor Mchaonyerwa also obtained his PhD degree in 2003 from the same university after his master's study was upgraded and also with a scholarship from the European Union. Professor Mchaonyerwa joined the Department of Agronomy, University of Fort Hare in July 2004 as a lecturer and was promoted to senior lecturer in 2006 and associate professor in 2011. He then joined the School of Agricultural Earth and Environmental Sciences, University of KwaZulu-Natal, Peter Marisbeck, South Africa in July, 2011, as an associate professor and was promoted to full professor in 2021. Professor Mchaonyer was research area covers soil carbon and nutrient cycling for improved agricultural productivity and environmental quality including mitigation of causes and effects of climate change. His research focus is on conservation agriculture, organic waste use and nutrient recovery from waste waters. He has successfully supervised to graduation 17 PhD students and 43 master's students, and also mentored three postdoctoral fellows and published over 100 research articles in peer reviewed journals conference proceedings, as well as book chapters uh, published with various uh, publishers such as Springer, Taylor and Francis and Elzevia. And he is currently supervising six PhD students and three master's students. Professor Mchaonyerwa has examined nine PhD theses and 21 MSc dissertations from 10 universities, both nationally and internationally. He is a reviewer 
of a number of journals in the field in his field, including exotoxicology and environmental safety, amongst uh, many other journals. He is also an external assessor for promotion pub, uh, application for different uh, universities. And he also continues to review research uh, proposals, uh, for example, for the Water Research Commission and the National Research Foundation. And he has also reviewed ones for the National Geographic. Uh, he has served as a guest editor of a special issue in the journal Land. Uh, Professor Mchaonyerwa has been invited uh, to a number of international conferences uh, as a key speaker, uh, both nationally and internationally. He is a C2 uh, rated scientist by the National Research Foundation, South Africa, since 2021. He was a recipient of the 2011 Vice Chancellor's Emerging Researcher Award at the University of Fort Hare before joining UKZN. He was a recipient also of several research grants from the National Research Foundation, uh, Water Research Commission, uh, and other international uh, funding agencies. In addition, he has assisted uh, postgraduate students in applying for funding from several organizations which assisted uh, in funding their research activities. Professor Mchaonyerwa is also a member of several societies, including the Soil Science Society of South Africa, the Soil Science Society of Zimbabwe, and the Rehabilitation Society of Southern Africa, and uh, other uh, societies internationally. He is also a member of the Professional Advisory Committee of the South African Council of Natural Scientific uh, Professions. And today is also another special day for Professor Mchaonyerwa. Uh, it's his birthday. So please join me in wishing him a happy, blessed birthday. Uh, Professor Mchaonyerwa, I invite you to present your lecture. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, uh, Professor Sibia, for such uh, an introduction. Um, when you were reciting that introduction, I started wondering whether you are really talking about me. But anyway, um, the, what you were saying, I could relate. Well, um, I would like to uh, say that, uh, in fact, I need to acknowledge all the university leadership and other leaders um, here present. I would like to acknowledge everybody that is set aside time to listen to my talk. And I, I guess uh, everybody was attracted by, uh, you know, trying to understand how the soil whispers. And I will try to show you along the way. But as, as I, I talk, I would like to make sure that everybody learns at least one thing. If I manage that, that everybody learns at least one thing, or I create some kind of controversy that will make sure that you will talk about it even after the, 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 the uh, inaugural lecture itself, I would have done my job. Sorry. Yes, um, like uh, Professor Sibia has indicated, um, my, my birthday is the 14th of July, 1971. And since that day, when I was born at the riverbank and started playing with the soil then, uh, I continue to play with soil even now. It's just that, you know, things have changed the game. The games have just been changed. But anyway, since that time, the population of the world has more than doubled. And that created a need for much more food, fiber, and feed. And yet we are facing challenges of declining productivity and also climate change. 
We also, because of the large numbers, tend to abuse natural resources, which creates much more waste with great management challenges. And um, our challenges that we face today are mainly caused by humans. And the soil is right at the center. Well, um, anyway, um, we, we, um, the, the degradation of the soil it actually creates a challenge um, in terms of the, the productivity. Um, and we, have, we can see that um, more than 16% of the, the, the global land area um, 22% of Africa, 60% of South Africa, the soils are degraded. And the mainly erosion is the main challenge, mainly human uh, induced. And um, our challenges in terms of crop productivity are associated with low organic carbon in agricultural soils together with erosion. And erosion causes serious problems on soil and water, soil, water, and air quality. And the, we, when we get poor quality soils, which is where we get our food from, then the food that we get will also be poor quality. Um, a friend of mine used to say, you eat what you eat ate. So if you are feeding, you are, you are um, eating a piece of steak, or from a cow that was feeding on a very poor quality veld, which grew on a poor soil, then the nutrients that you're getting from that would be equally the same as what the soil has. So um, when we have got poor soils, we've got lower crop yields, we've got poorer pastures, poorer livestock productivity, and that even compromises um, uh, our uh, profitability of uh, our agricultural systems. Well, like I indicated earlier, I've been flirting with the soil from birth. And when I was, when I was born at the river bank, I started playing with the soil and I haven't graduated. It's just that I've, I've just been changing games, the games that I've been playing. Well, it is, should be noted that all life depends on the soil. I know that there are people that can object to this, but if you really apply your mind, you will see that the soil is the bedrock for everything. You can also even imagine medicine. Um, some of the, um, um, the vaccines that, and, and well, some of the medications that we get originate uh, from, from the soil. Um, well, agricultural um, interventions that we sometimes use, like inoculants, they also originate from the soil. So it is important to know that each soil has got its own story, just like every other human being has got their own story. And that story relates to the formation, the potential, and the use and abuse that could have happened and all the management that would have been done. Well, uh, when we say the soil whispers, I'm sure you can look at those um, uh, soil profiles. I'm sure you can see my picture there and the different soils. And you can see those soils are different and those differences are actually telling you the story from, uh, from the formation of those soils, the potential of those soils and um, the management under which they have been put. And those stories um, have got uh, significant effects on um, food productivity, resilience to climate change, and their potential to, uh, for, for waste and pollution management. We say the soil whispers. We need to listen, observe, and then manage the soil. To, to provide us with the solutions that we need. Of course, while most soils are naturally poor, 
human activities are a major cause. Well, um, I would like to zero in on, on, on erosion a little bit here. Well, you would have seen in, in, in various parts of Africa, but in South Africa in particular, that there are vast tracts of agricultural land uh, that have been abandoned as a result of erosion. Well, of course, erosion results in, in um, poor soil depth. I'm sure you can see my picture there. Uh, you see I'm standing on, on next to, to nothing in terms of soil. And when that material has been eroded, it actually gets into rivers and the, the sand results in siltation and the nutrients that would have been eroded causes eutrophication. So we need to reduce runoff and erosion. We need to add nutrients to the soils to be able to, for those soils to be more productive. We need to improve organic matter and we need to um, make sure that any nutrients that would have been lost should be recovered. Because when we improve soil organic matter, uh, we improve um, a, a substrate for soil organisms. I'm sure you can see some earthworms there. Um, you, you, you will also see uh, that as we improve soil organic matter, there is improvement in water, water uh, retention, stability as well, and then resilience to climate change. So this is best, basically the background that um, uh, I'm giving. So now our studies tended to focus. I'm saying our studies because I was not doing this work alone and I would need to acknowledge everybody that contributed. And our studies um, um, were really based on erosion, conservation agriculture, um, uh, nutrient cycling, and trying to close the nutrient re uh, loss loops. Well, we did, in fact, there is a link between yield gaps and soil quality. A yield gap is the difference between the yield potential of an area and the yield that is actually realized by a farmer. We realized from our studies that wheat yields in, the, uh, in South Africa uh, tended to be associated with soil organic carbon and higher, uh, in fact, greater gaps, which means uh, we, we, uh, we can still push uh, the farmer yield more um, in the eastern uh, high veld and cooler, um, the, the cooler central, uh, more in the free state and, and, and northern Cape, uh, because those areas, they tend to have low organic matter. In addition, um, the availability of uh, potassium and, and phosphorus also contribute in terms of these yield gaps. So if and these are caused by, you know, nutrient mining where we just harvest um, and no, add, not adding any nutrients. When we add fertilizers, most, a large number of those nutrients get into the crop residues that we may uh, harvest or feed to animals. Um, or we 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 um, we 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 may leave them on this on the land, and the, a large portion is actually uh, taken as the harvest, which we will then use as food. So, in my view, food waste and human waste are the largest nutrient and carbon leakages from agricultural systems, because most of the times they don't come back to the soil. And soil erosion results in loss of the soil, nutrients, and organic carbon. Well, uh, we did, we, in trying to understand this soil erosion, we did some studies um, in the Eastern Cape, but it is important to note first that most soils in South Africa are formed from shales and mudstones. And the in 
in the, these particular parent materials in South Africa have got a particularly high sin uh, content of silt and fine sand. Of course, other parent materials also okay, sandstone and dolerite. And of course, in the north, we also have granite. And in our survey in the Eastern Cape, we actually found that in the semi-arid and arid regions uh, on um, mudstone derived, shells and mudstone derived soils, very fine sand and fine sand and silt dictate the degree of uh, erosion. While on those derived from dolerite, iron oxide is the most uh, important factor, which, which, is, which determines erodibility of the soil. And in this work, we actually saw that there was no relationship whatsoever between soil organic carbon and the degree of soil erosion. And this could be uh, related to very low um, soil organic carbon contents. We have the, the soils that we are talking about here had less than 0.6% carbon. So that's very low for it to start influencing um, the um the stability of the soil um we then did some studies in the northern coast and natal to relate soil aggregate stability uh with um, with soil organic matter and we realized that pastures and grasslands tend to have higher um soil organic carbon and aggregate stability than crop the soils and um, that can actually be seen there on the um, on the uh, bars where on the bars um, on the top right where the on the three different soils the cultivated soils which um, which which have are the, um, the 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 light colored bar there they have got much lower mean weight diameter low agri stability. We then uh, did uh, a relationship and we found that up to a certain point, agri stability will not increase. So it looks like there is a threshold there. Um, and for these soils that tend to have um, three, the 31 to 62% clay, the threshold looks like it is between three and 4%. Um, and well, it, when we look at the lack of relationship with, uh, with, with the, the degree of uh, um, erosion on the work that was done by Mnyevere et al, it kind of indicates that there is a minimum, there could be a minimum threshold as well for uh, soils to re respond to organic matter in terms of aggregate stability. And that limit is actually less than 0.1%. Well, um, while we have got those soils that have got low organic carbon, we also have others that are on the higher end. And in South Africa, those tend to be unique soils, soils that are highly productive. Um, and we found that cropping which includes a bit of tillage, results in the reduction in soil organic matter, but mainly in the zero to five centimeter depth. And we also found that in the subsoil, there's a, a lot of carbon. I'm sure if you look at those pictures there, if you look at that shovel, the soil is dark to a depth. That all is carbon. Um, and yet when you till the soil, it's only the top five centimeters that is being affected. So when we looked at the um, carbon stored in the profile to a depth of one meter, we realized that these soils have got huge amounts of carbon such that if they were, the carbon was to be released, they would contribute significantly to climate change. So the management is such that we need to maintain that carbon stored in those soils. Well, um, but in terms of relationship between uh, soil organic 
carbon and um, and organic and and stability. The difference also occurred. Yeah, the effect of of of, of carbon uh, only occurred in the top soil as well, which indicates that well we need much more a greater increase in soil carbon to influence agri stability of humic soils. Otherwise, they are stabilized by other mechanisms. So, with these sorts of uh, you know stab stable soils, humic soils, these soils only form about four percent, and the rest have got low carbon. And so based on this, it, it can be shown, said that if we raise organic carbon, we can actually increase agri-stability of more than 96% of South African soils with the benefits of soil water improvement, reduced erodibility, increase the productivity and resilience to uh, climate change. Well, we then tried to see whether um, this carbon in humic soil could still be improved. Well, of course, most of these humic soils are used for sugarcane production in South Africa. Uh, of course, there are some are under forest. So with sugarcane, there is burning, uh, while others practice green care, where they do not burn. So does burning have an effect? or does green cane result in higher carbon? And then definitely um, we found that soils under green cane had higher carbon and microbial biomass and enzyme activities. And this was to do with higher biomass retention. Um, and from the, uh, the uh, floods that occurred here in KZN, uh, on this farm that we worked in, which had 76 years of green cane, there was lower flooding on that farm, lower erosion than surrounding farms that practice burning, uh, um, uh, burning of cane. So, well, we are trying to study further, you know, uh, whether these soils take in much more water and store it and um, um, resulting in less runoff. So from this, it indicates that there is greater need to increase biomass production and to increase soil organic carbon, especially for those soils that are low in, um, in carbon. Well, we, 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 we did some work and on a long-term trial at uh, uh, Bethlehem, 39 years. Uh, and we saw that um, there was no treatment effect, even if you don't till the soil, you retain the residues and so on. There is no effect on biomass production. After 39 years, there's no effect on soil organic matter. The content of soil organic matter in the top, uh, five, uh, top uh, uh, five centimeters was actually less than, was about 1% which is, well, 0. Uh, well 9.1 uh, grams per kg, that's 0.9%. So if you look at that, it just shows that even in the grassland, adjust, adjacent grassland, grassland, which is not really tilled, there is low organic carbon. So because of the soil, soil characteristics, maybe, and low biomass input, the organic matter is not, there is a limit to, to which we can raise organic matter on these uh, agricultural systems. But well, of course, if we change the system to improve biomass, maybe we could increase, increase organic matter. So well, we looked at uh, another study uh, in the wheat region, and we found that when you rotate the wheat with cover crops, there is a tendency to increase um, soil organic carbon um, because of um, um, the improvement in biomass input. Um, so because of that, we thought, well, let's look at um, um, studies on a number of cover crops that we could use. And from a number of studies listed there, 
we we actually found that um, um, oats, triticale, radish, and uh, forage pea, grazing veg. Well, of course, there could be a lot more, but these were promising cover crops that could be used in winter and rotated with um, the um, summer crops, um, which could be maize um, or, or, or wheat or other uh, cover crops, or other crops, main crops. Well, we then used some of these cover crops um, as mulch and to look at the effect on maize yields on moisture and moisture. And we found that um, maize yields were much higher where you've got grazing veg and oats as cover crops, as well as um, faba, faba bean or forage pea. And this was in response to moisture, um, in, in mainly in the topsoil. If you look at uh, the volumetric water contents there, those uh, two treatments uh, tend to have higher moisture in the top. Of course, there are differences in the subsoil at the beginning of the season mainly because the cover crop could also be harvesting moisture in the subsoil. Um, so this indicates that if we can store moisture because of the mulch from the cover crop, we can provide enough moisture for the subsequent main crop, which will then be either the maize or uh, wheat, or any, or any other. Um, so then we, we looked at uh, rotations uh, of, of um, oats and veg with maize. Uh, well, we, of course, with fertilization, but we found that cover crops tend to increase uh, the labile fractions of soil organic matter. And um, where there is there, there was veg, there was no need to, to fertilize. Um, uh, in fact, when compared to, to oats, to make, fertilize the, the, uh, the cover crop. Um, and, and the effects that we are seeing here are okay, again related to biomass inputs. Um, and so we are looking at, well, oats doing well, veg doing well. Could we combine these and produce much more, more biomass? Um, so we did some biculture studies um, um, and we realized that bicultures or, or mixtures of oats and veg in different ratios, you can actually see on the table there, those that are in bold, they are actually indicating the contribution of the 70 30 70 percent by seed rate to 30 percent uh, veg by seed rate and that was actually the best uh, mixture in terms of dry matter maize yield and we then also looked at uh, the contribution on soil health and we found that that same mixture tended to also um, uh, contribute significantly to soil organic carbon enzyme activities. And we, uh, we need to note that as much as there was a change in terms of soil organic carbon, the overall soil organic carbon was still low, 1.14%. So after having done this for two seasons, we're still getting 1.14% carbon, starting from 0. Um, 0 0.96 from the, in the weed fallow. So this actually tells you that there could actually be a limit to which we can push the boundaries in terms of increasing this organic uh, carbon. It's not open-ended. I think I mentioned that earlier. We then on, went on to look at some studies, and these are still ongoing, uh, of cover crop rotations, where silage maize is actually removed. And we found that oats, where oats um, has been included, and its bicultures, there is much more 
uh, cover crop biomass. And uh, well, the maize yields were higher in, in treatments that had got vetch, which is more a result of uh, increase in availability of nitrogen. Well, of course, could, we, would, we, we have seen that bicultures are useful, um, but yes, this could be work, workable on commercial farms or on farms that we can control animals. But in, in communal areas, maybe not possible. So may we, maybe we need to consider um, summer uh, cover crops. So we had to look at some summer cover crops. Um, well, we tested uh, cowpeas, um, uh, uh, sunham, and kuna, and lab lab, and it became very clear that cowpea and sunham gave the greatest dry matter, right? And uh, well, sometimes in these small holder settings, the land is limited. So having to set aside a piece of land for just a cover crop without the main crop may, can be uh, difficult. So maybe sometimes you would need to do strip cropping. But then the challenge is the animal still needs to feed. And those cover crops may not remain there. Uh, the residues may not remain there for long. So maybe we would need to consider incorporating, that means including tillage to some extent. Well, I know that also scientists will argue that, well, you must be crazy, but um, this is the only way we can actually make sure that the, the animals will not feed on the residues that we need. Of course, this is a decision that a farmer would need to make because they might actually consider their animals to be more important than trying to improve the soil quality. But of course, um, that can be debated. So well, other alternatives, organic waste um, uh, could be could come in. And here we are saying that an added fertilizer nutrient that we, we will buy fertilizer, we add it into the soil, it needs to do a lot of work before it gets lost to the environment. That's the, the, the philosophy. So manures, crop residues, and other organics um, may need to be put back, which I'm sure a number of people would say, yes, we are doing it. But it, it, depending on the quality, there might need be need for composting. Yeah, 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 had a pardon. Well, I, I, I was just trying to move a bar and, and then I clicked the wrong, the wrong button. Sorry about that. Um, thanks very much. As manures, some manures are very poor quality and they might need to be composted and reached so that uh, they, um, they can be better uh, uh, amendments. We uh, did a number of studies of composting, well, uh, tobacco waste, uh, pine bark uh, um, with manure and vermiculite. I will focus a little bit on, on vermiculite-based compost. In this case, we were increasing the amount of vermiculite in the compost and we composted that material. And we found that the, um, the chemical composition changed a bit um, in terms of carbon, it decreased. Of course, it, it, it's a dilution effect. There's more vermiculite being added. Um, but then the calcium magnesium increased because vermiculite is also coming in with these elements. But then when we used this, uh, this compost, we realized that in a drier season, 2017, 2018, the increase in vermiculite um, in the um, compost um, resulted in increase in maize yields under field conditions. And well, in that study, we had not looked at the moisture. Um, in, 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 um, in this study, we had not looked at the moisture. We had to do um, a small grasshouse experiment to look at what happens to, so, to, to moisture when 
we uh, am amend soils with this. And we realized that on the table there, you see those numbers in bold that indicate that with the, uh, uh, the increasing um, uh, amount of vermiculite, there is increased moisture stored. Um, and um, I, I would, um, I, I think I, I need, uh, I'm, I'm really talking about this region here. Um, there is higher moisture there in the, in the where where we have um, higher vermiculite, and that tells us that this compost could actually help us to produce crops in um, drier conditions where climate change would have affected us. Well, other composting that we have done using earthworms. We had uh, manure and uh, waste paper. We incorporated rock phosphate to enrich the composts and worms did the job. And from that, uh, the, the, com the uh, for rock phosphate that we added here is uh, of igneous origin and it is not soluble. But when we incorporated it, it became much more soluble. If you look at um, those um, uh, graphs, uh, the ones in green, you know, the, the top one and the, uh, the top ones A and B, those ones are available P. So available phosphorus increased significantly with increase uh, in concentration of, um, um, of rock phosphate and with combusting. So when we look at that, and of course, you can also see that the nitrogen also became more available. And so if we use these composts, where we um, we have we we can um, we can make phosphorus um, and and nitrogen more available, and because the the carbon there in the compost is also stabilized, it will also add stable carbon to the soil. Well, other ways that may need to be managed, include, you know, if you have got manure, we could also use it to produce biogas, you know, but uh, the waste that comes from there still has nutrients, and we tested that as, as a fertilizer. And what we saw was that biogas slurry increased dry matter um, yield and grain yield of, and, and of, of, um, of Maize, you know, when we compare to the control where um, nothing was actually added. But then when we co applied that um, biogas slurry with a mineral fertilizer, there, was a, um, there were mixtures that stood out. Um, um, and, and that is very, very helpful in, in you know, if you look at these mixtures where we have got 48 uh, kgs of, uh, of nitrogen as biogas slurry and 78 is, um, kgs of nitrogen as chemical fertilizer, you can look at what happens to the dry matter and the grain yield there of, of the maize and the nutrient uptake. It's really um, raised. So uh, we may actually need to uh, co-apply. Um, um, these the bagger slurry with chemical fertilizer that will help it will reduce the cost uh, the money that we spend on on chemical fertilizers because the nutrients will come there from um, the bagger slurry. But in addition to that, we also get greater benefit in terms of nutrients, uh, soil quality. Um, um, I would like to refer you to the same combination. So quality available phosphorus highest in that ratio there of chemical uh, so, uh, bagger slurry and chemical fertilizers the same combinations they improved soil um, uh, quality and successive application of these you know over a, a, a number of season in, improved this soil quality you can see season one and season two tends to have higher concentrations of nutrients and 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 the uh, it affects it, it and, and the pH also increased. 
Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I hope uh, I didn't lose anybody. Um, so other slurries that could be produced, you know, a lot of uh, systems, you know, piggery systems are okay in yeah, across the world. And there's a lot of pig slurry that is being pro that is produced. And sometimes we dispose of it by land application. You can see uh, that equipment there, that uh, tractor and the bowser spreading pig slurry onto the land. And we studied uh, the effect of such a pig slurry application on at, at Bainsfield, a farm here in, in the Midlands. Uh, and we realized that over 20 years of uh, application reduced the soil organic matter. Well, of course, people would have thought that it would increase, but it actually reduced. And that has to do with uh, the, um, um, the, the, the in increase in microbial activity. Uh, the, what we would call a priming effect, which would result in a rapid decomposition of even the resident organic matter. So there is need to, um, to, to, to be cautious there when we apply these slurries. Yes, it will bring in a lot of nutrients. If you look at those tables there, the amount of phosphorus um, after 20 years of application is really high, 120 milligrams of, um, um, of, uh, of phosphorus per kg of soil. And of course, the, I, I've got grams per kg there. It's uh, supposed to be milligrams. That's very high. Uh, well, um, the critical values that we need, the optimum amounts would be between 20 and 30. And here we're talking about 120. So this farmer could actually produce maize without applying any fertilizer for a number of years. So this means that we need to couple our management with soil tests. Otherwise, you know, um, a soil test would actually whisper to you to reduce cost on fertilizer. Um, so, and, and also we might actually need to reduce on uh, the period of application of the slurry on a piece of land. But the leakage of these nutrients may actually get onto surface water bodies causing eutrophication. And that might result in growth of macrophytes. And can we recover those nutrients? Well, yes, we, um, we've, we felt that um, um, this leakage causes eutrophication. There's growth of algae and macrophytes, duckweed. We conducted a survey um, uh, in the Midlands, in KwaZulu-Natal, looked at farms that, that do dairy, piggery, crocodile farms. Um, and those farms had pictures like the one that you are seeing on top there. That is not algae. Those are macrophytes. Those are plants that uh, the, the plant, this, the plant is um, the size of a fingernail or even smaller. And that's where the leaf is. Everything is there. The root is there as well. Everything is there. So farmers asked for herbicides when we were doing the survey to kill that because they saw that as a nuisance. And we believe that that's not a nuisance. The nuisance is the farmer who is polluting that water. And those, uh, those um, plants are just a communication mechanism that nature is, is using to tell us that here there is polluted water. So we, we, we then assembled those um, uh, um, macrophytes and analyzed them. We realized, if you can look on the table there, you can see the, the, the concentration of, of nitrogen, 5%. You know, chicken manure would be around 3%, 5%. And look at the, the amount of potassium, 7%. Those are loads of nutrients. And of course, there is variation depending on the, uh, the farm, uh, depending on the type of um, waste that is being um, uh, um, uh, uh, lost into the water bodies. But the C to N ratio there indicates that these materials are highly, can be highly degradable. 
so they can be used as fertilizer materials. So we went on to harvest them, um, dried them, incorporated into them into soils. And we realized that the N mineralized the, the nitrogen. And when I say N, of course, I'm not talking to, to soil scientists, all soil scientists, but a nitrogen mineralization occurred within 20, 28 to 42 days. A large amounts. Of course, the rates that we used here were very high. Some of them were as high as, you know, um, 400 uh, uh, kilogram, uh, uh, kilograms, equivalents of course, 400 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, just because um, we, we were doing it as an incubation. So we needed uh, to be able to measure the differences. And there was significant fertilizer value. If you look at um, those gra graphs that indicate the dry matter um, uh, as based on the increase in the rate of uh, application based on using um, the duckweed as a fertilizer. You can actually see the increase there on those graphs. There. But the challenge that we faced was how do we recover all the duckweed from the ponds? It's, it's, it's a bit difficult. I guess this would require collaboration with people in engineering that could actually help us there, but we, we haven't gone there. But the best way, if we do want to avoid that, that challenge, is to recover the nutrients as, as source where uh, they are being produced. And we, we tested that. And we, if, if you look at uh, um, that, those um, beakers there, the one on the left is the um, uh, waste water that is, is still had some debility within seven to 14 days. It looked that clean. Of course, well, of course, we we we, we didn't test um, uh, pathogens in there. But in terms of the level of nitrogen, it was low enough. In fact, it was just so low, very close to zero, that it could actually be deposited into uh, water systems without causing any pollution. So uh, we we thought that is a, a, a method a method that could actually be used. Of course, we have got other wastes um, that we uh, encounter. Uh, West from we like like I indicated earlier that the the waste leakage is from um, um, the uh, food that we produce, the losses of that food in, in this value chain, and the the um, the waste that we produce, you know, uh, fecal waste in, in urine. And I'm sure you can actually see there uh, latrine waste, waste being emptied and, and so on. And all those end up at the landfill sites with the uh, release of greenhouse gases, with the uh, pollution of uh, groundwater, with nitrate. So we can actually reduce the organic waste that goes to the landfill and improve soil quality. And here, the philosophy is that we should not and nothing should actually go to waste. Everything should um, be used. Well, in terms of organic waste, of course, um, you you will you will um, you will see that you know some of the um, the waste, like human waste, um, ends up at the landfill sites. We could apply it directly, but here we thought maybe let's try entrenching it and growing trees. And I'm sure you can see those trenches there. Um, um, you, 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 you can see the trenches. Um, and in those trenches, we added the sludges, the, the, the sludges and grew trees there. And after uh, two cycles of trees, we went on to um, to study the, uh, the tree growth. And we found that at very high rates of application, we could still see the effects on tree growth. And when we looked at the, um, the roots of the trees, they were only, they were confined in the organic layer, right? Which, which, which was from the sewage sludge. 
And when we looked closely, we actually found um, the roots into that and accompanied by mycorrhizal fungi, which helped it take up the nutrients to benefit the crop. And the, um, the organic matter still could be seen after 12 years. You know, so we could actually store organic matter from sewage sludge by entrenching and keep it there. For 12 years, it was still looking like this. I'm sure you can see there, that's the trench and that's the surrounding soil. Well, of course, we, uh, I, I just thought maybe um, a, a bit of food for thought. I'm not involved in this research of, um, of, of, of human bodies, but we are also a bolt of nutrients. So when we bury our loved ones, the plants that grow there in the graveyard, it's almost like entrenchment. So the trees that grow there, will the roots will get in there into the, in the, into the grave a benefit from the nutrients, and the carbon could still be stored there. Of course, it's not an area that I know that nobody would, would allow me ethical clearance to do that sort of work. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting, I think, but um, I, I guess I will not get ethical clearance from, for that. Um, we then looked at urine, human urine, um, and we found that well, uh, it, uh, when applied directly, it increases the yield of, we use the vegetable here, not necessarily to be able to feed on it, but um, just to show the response of a crop. And the increase was related very close. And in fact, it was similar to urine at the same rate. Now, if it is so beneficial to urea, I then did a little calculation and I found that with the 60,000, based on the, you know, the fact that an hour on average you will produce about 1.5 liters of urine per day, and there's 0.7% of nitrogen in, in urine, of the 60,000 people at UKZN could actually pro, uh, contribute 660 kgs of N per day. And that is equivalent to uh, enough for five tons, five hectares of maize. Well, if we think about what we could supply in one semester, how about the whole year? Because um, that requires some shift in mindset. We then tested the same urine, co-applied it with human feces. Well, the, the way it was separated, you can see there's a little toilet in the corner there that has got a little hole, two holes, one small one and one big one. Those were to separate the urine from um, the, uh, the feces. Uh, so that we would then be able to manage them without uh, them being mixed. And we found that a mixture of human urine and feces, you know, at 125 kgs of, of, of nitrogen uh, to 25 kgs of nitrogen uh, through feces, resulted in higher yield than yield alone, than urine alone, sorry. So that uh, gave us the impression that we may need to manage um, combining them. Of course, not, uh, it's not the same as taking them directly from a toilet, which is the normal practice, because the, the ratios of the mixtures will not be the same. We then went on to produce, uh, well, worked with uh, struvite, which is um, a fertilizer produced from human urine. And fed, we, we found that it also increased yield on clays and sandy soils, higher uh, P uptake, higher N uptake, nitrogen uptake, phosphorus and nitrogen uptake, increasing the yield. So, well, some of the organics that we were talking about, you know, um, uh, food waste, like we found that there's lots of we, food waste at the market. You know, tomatoes go bad, potatoes go bad, and they can't be sold. We decided to produce uh, biochar from that and then try to see how best it can contribute. We also used uh, med biochars from um, human waste as well, the fecal sludges, 
from pit latrines, uh, um, sewage sludge as well. And what we actually found was when we, uh, as much as these biochars can stay in the soil for a long period of time because of their recalcitrants, because of the aromatic structures that they have. Of course, they, they also contribute to modifying the soil pH. When we tested them as soil amendments, even with fertilizer application and fertilizer application, we saw serious nitrogen deficiencies. So when we apply biochars to soil, we need to think about how we manage our, um, our nitrogen. Otherwise, yes, we might increase carbon stored, but fail to produce food from that. We also tested the mobility of heavy metals in soils amended with biochars from thicker sludge and pine bark. And we found, of course, on the, here we are, I'm just showing to uh, one element, copper, and the sorption of copper is quite high uh, on thicker uh, sludges, uh, soy sludge and latrine waste. And when we applied effluent into a soil that was amended and leached that effluent, the solution that came from that uh, um, column did not have any copper. Uh, for uh, up to four leaching events. But after that, the only the one that didn't have an amendment showed some copper in the leachate, which then means that initially it was absorption on soils, but then now the contribution of the biochars, you can see there, there is nothing on... Um, there's, there's, there's nothing um, seen in the, in the um, where, where the sludges were added, 50 tons, 100 tons. If you look there, they, they can't even show. But this is where we didn't add any sludges, the copper uh, leached. So this is another benefit um, of the biochars. Well, we thought we can't just end there without thinking about another major waste. We go to the barber shop every day and the, the waste that comes from there, the human hair ends up at the landfill site. And just, we just thought, well, let's look at the composition of this hair waste by um, um, ethnic, uh, different ethnicities no uh, Caucasian, African, and Indian here. And there was variation. You know, um, there was lower carbon nitrogen and higher potassium in, uh, in African hair than Caucasian hair. African hair also had lower nitrogen and higher calcium than Indian hair. We generally believe that uh, hair doesn't decompose. Well, in the soil with optimum moisture and air, that is oxygen, and the temperature conditions are conducive, the hair will decompose. And you can see that, that graph there that shows um, the nitrate. Um, and nitrate can only be produced after producing uh, ammonium. So up to 28 days, there was very little of nitrate being released. And after that, you've got a lot of nitrate being released. And that nitrate is being released from nitrification of the ammonia. Now, if you think about this, this nitrate indicates that the, the organic nitrogen that was in the human hair is being converted to inorganic nitrogen. That means it's, the hair is decomposing. Now, if you have got so much nitrate in a landfill site, it will lead to groundwater. Or denitrification could actually take place, greenhouse gases nitrous oxides into um, the atmosphere. So we, after having looked at all that and the mineralization, we then tested that as a, as a fertilizer. And it is interesting to note that after, after pre-incubating for 28 days, this one here is African hair, pre-incubated for 28 days. And that's Caucasian hair, pre-incubated for 28 days. I'm sure you can actually see there that there is a difference in terms of the growth of those plants. 
This is pre-incubated for 84 days. There is um, a large increase um, when, when, we, when it comes to from 28 to uh, 48. But it's particularly important to note the Caucasian here. There's much more there. Um, I, I would want to refer you to these graphs here in terms of the dry matter coming from those um, um, uh, pictures there. That um, African hair just requires to be pre-incubated for 28 days. Then um, you produce enough biomass as Caucasian hair pre-incubated for 84 days. And that is related to nitrogen uptake. Um, so sorry. My okay. So having said all this, I just want to conclude by saying that we need to listen and support our soils in order to substantially draw maximum benefits. And high biomass uh, CA systems are important to increase soil organic carbon, aggressibility, and reducing the erodibility, also increasing soil moisture storage, which increases crop productivity and uh, resilience to climate change. Summer cover crops may need to be used, but the biomass may need to be composted or made into biochar, but we need to uh, monitor the, the nitrogen availability there and possibly support with nitrogen fertilizer. Organic wastes have got value to improve soil organic carbon storage, nutrient recovery. A new trend, even in human waste, should work multiple times before it is lost. We need to close the nutrient loss loops. Um, there are limits, of course, to which, uh, to which we can increase soil organic carbon in soils. It depends on specific soil characteristics and climatic conditions. So it's not open-ended. Well, of course, all these improvements that we are talking about need to be accompanied by frequent soil analysis. Of course, you would remember that a, a pig slurry may have lowered soil organic carbon when applied for a long period of time. And yet there was excessive phosphorus with potential for water pollution. So there's need for soil analysis there, frequent soil analysis to help uh, decide on what the soil is telling us. For emerging farmers, you know, you, you could have been allocated or you would have bought a farm or whatever uh, way, however you would have gotten a farm. It is important to note that even if this, the farm was highly productive before you got in, you need to respect the soils. Um, soils deserve your respect. Healthy soils take you far. Again. Well, some suggestions. Well, I would just start by just saying that Findings from our research and those of others provide a suite of solutions for individual farmers, communities, government departments, and the soil initiative for Africa being led by FARA for the African Union. While some of these um, 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 solutions are ready for applications, other, others need further studies. And this would include CA research, conservation agriculture research on multiple cover crops, mixtures with kettles in different regions. And we also need to look at within season moisture and nutrient dynamics in CA or conservation agriculture systems and green cane production systems. This will help us for fertilizer management. And uh, we need to, uh, technology transfer is now needed for combos, with rock phosphate, tobacco waste, vermiculite, and other uh, compost. And of course, there is need to look at ways to harvest macrophytes so that they can actually be used because their value have been preserved. 
proven. Uh, but we also need to develop and apply other urine-based solid products for easier storage of the N. I say here, umuntu, umuntu, ngabantu, because all this that I've been talking about was made possible by a whole lot of other people. And I don't want to sit here and brag that it's all about me. It is because of many students that I've worked with and other colleagues. So 17 PhD students from different countries. And of course, some of them are already leaders in their own right in universities, government departments, research organizations, and other institutions. I'm not going to mention them by name. I'm sure a number of them would also be watching. I applaud you guys. Thanks very much for taking me this far. Well, I also need to acknowledge all other people that have contributed to my growth. These include friends, colleagues, these, these colleagues could be academic, technical, administrative staff, and all my other collaborators. I just need to mention a few people here that got me, um, that some of whom held my hand, others are also contributed in holding their hands. But at the same time, we grew up together. Prof Mkeni, Prof Chiduza, Prof Mpepereki, well, we may his soul rest in peace. Prof Shenu, Prof Wuta, Prof Laker, he introduced me to the South African uh, classification system of soils and the word whispering actually came from him when he introduced me to the South African soil classification system. That's how I coined my title of my talk. Prof Mapanda, Prof Hughes, Prof Buckley, may his soul rest in peace. Prof. Odindo, Prof. Subo, Prof. Shaplo, Prof. Silo, Dr. Zengeni, and Prof. Um, uh, Mr. Nyamgafata. These are people that worked very closely with me. I worked with many others that I didn't mention by name. It's not because they are less important. I just thought I could mention these ones. And the work has been funded by a number of organizations, but I just thought I could present these ones that produce the bulk of the funding. Um, uh, here, I need to acknowledge my family. While I was doing all this, um, my family uh, supported me. I'm talking about my wife, my son, my daughter. I'm also talking about my parents who got me to got me uh, we, we, they give birth they gave birth to me, raised me to be a man um, and educated me. Um, I also thank all my friends, all my other relatives, like I indicated, Umundu, Ngubuntu, Ngabantu. The person is a person because of all other people surrounding him, his community. I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Antonyera. I truly appreciate this. Uh, I want to extend this of wishing you a birthday today. Uh, I'm hoping that you're going to celebrate more. Um, I won't go deep and wider into what you presented here today for the interest of time, but I want to wish you all the best. And I'm hoping that all colleagues who are listening all over here, all over in Africa, South Africa and the world. And we truly, truly appreciate um, of professorship of that caliber. And we, as UKZN, on behalf of Professor Nana Poku, and the registrar is here. We want to wish you all the best. It's good to have professors of that caliber who has done extensive work about what you have done. And we are so proud of you and we want to wish you all the best. And thank you very much. And thank you.